to night. Trump convicted. Trump was convicted of 34 felonies connected to concealing hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Iran re-elects. Iran opens registration for candidates for upcoming presidential election following the death of Dr. Ibrahim Raisi. Waterborne diseases. Waterborne disease strikes a new risk in South American country as flood hits Brazil. Therapy dogs. Therapy dogs assist elementary school children in enhancing their reading skills by providing a comforting and supportive presence. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you're joining us on World News Tonight. We have a number of stories to update you on this evening. For the first time in American history, a former president has been convicted of a crime. Donald Trump is found guilty on all 34 criminal charges against him by a New York jury officially making him a felon. This was a disgrace. Donald Trump became the first U.S. president to be convicted of a crime on Thursday when a New York jury unanimously found him guilty on all 34 counts in his hush money trial involving Stormy Daniels. I'm a very innocent man. He is convicted of falsifying documents to cover up a payment to silence the porn star ahead of the 2016 election. The verdict plunges the U.S. into unexplored territory ahead of the presidential election on November 5th. Trump, who spoke shortly after the verdict, denies any wrongdoing. He's expected to appeal. He faces a maximum sentence of four years in prison, though others convicted of that crime often receive shorter sentences, fines, or probation. Incarceration would not prevent him from campaigning or taking office if he were to win. Trump will be sentenced on July 11th. The case was widely regarded as the least consequential of the four criminal prosecutions Trump faces. It was also likely to be the only one to go to trial before the election, as the others are delayed by procedural challenges. And on the road to the White House tonight, Biden campaign's communications director wrote in a statement in New York today that we saw that no one is above the law. The statement also stated that Donald Trump has always mistakenly believed he would never face consequences for breaking the law for his own personal gain. But today's verdict does not change the fact that the American people face a simple reality. There is still only one way to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office at the ballot box. Convicted felon or not, Trump will be the Republican nominee for the president. The threat Trump process to our democracy has never been greater. He is running an increasingly unhinged campaign of revenge and retribution, pledging to be a dictator on day one and calling for our constitution to be terminated so he can regain and keep power. A second Trump term means chaos, ripping away Americans' freedoms and fomenting political violence and the American people will reject it this November. Over 50 people reportedly died due to a heat stroke in different parts of this country since yesterday. These threats were reported as temperatures soared past 50 degrees Celsius in parts of North India, including Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan and Bihar this week. India has been experiencing a blistering hot summer and a part of Delhi recorded the country's highest ever temperature at 52.9 degrees Celsius this week, though that may be revised with the weather department checking the sensors of the weather station that registered the reading. Israel's assault on Rafah has blocked the primary border crossing into Egypt, limiting aid flow and the halting the number of people who had been leaving for medical treatment. Ahmed Abu Adhab was injured by Israeli fire when he went to the beach with a group of other children. He'd lost his home, like most Gazans, and wanted to wash himself in the sea. Ammunition landed as they came out on Tuesday, and shrapnel wounded him. Two days later, he was in Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis, one of a growing number of wounded stuck in embattled Gaza without medical aid. Israel's attack on Rafah has cut off the main border crossing into Egypt and stopped the trickle of people leaving Gaza for medical help. 
At Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in the central Gaza city of Deir al-Balah, Dr. Khalil al-Dakran said Israel's military campaign had unleashed a medical catastrophe. Israel blames Egypt for the closure, saying it wants to reopen Rafah to Gazan civilians who wish to flee. Israel's military said on Wednesday it had taken control of a buffer zone along the frontier, which gives the country effective authority over the Palestinian territory's entire land border. Egyptian officials and sources say humanitarian operations are at risk from military activity and that Israel needs to hand the crossing back to Palestinians before it starts operating again. Egypt is also worried Palestinians will be displaced from Gaza, as well as blocking patient transfers. Israel's attack on Rafah has all but cut off medical supplies and threatened its last functioning hospital. At a World Health Organization meeting on Wednesday, more than 30 countries condemned Israel's attacks on hospitals in Gaza and demanded more scrutiny of its role in the enclave's health crisis. Following the death of President Ibrahim Raisi, who was once seen as a possible successor to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Al Khamenei, Iran started registration of candidates for an early election in June. Iran on Thursday started registration of candidates for an early election next month, following the death of President Ibrahim Raisi in a helicopter crash. He was once seen as a possible successor to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's aging ultimate decision-maker. Now Raisi's sudden death in mid-May has triggered a race among conservatives to influence the selection of Iran's next leader. State media said former chief nuclear negotiator Saeed Jalili was the first heavyweight hardliner to register. Interim President Mohammad Mokbar is another name mentioned, as is former Parliament Speaker Ali Larijani. Several low-key moderate politicians are also likely to enter the race. After the five-day registration period, the Guardian Council, which oversees elections and legislation, will vet the contenders and publish a list of qualified candidates. Moderate politicians have accused the Hardline Council of disqualifying rivals to Hardline candidates, who are expected to dominate the upcoming race. Turnout may be hit by restricted choice on the ballot and rising discontent over an array of political, social and economic crises. Within Iran's complex mix of clerical rulers and elected officials, Khamenei has the final say on all state matters, such as nuclear and foreign policies. But the elected president will be in charge of tackling worsening economic hardship. Today, the 22nd National Assembly kicked off in South Korea. On the first day of its term, the ruling party emphasized the need for solidarity, while the opposition vowed to pass the contentious bill turned down by the previous assembly. The 22nd National Assembly kicked off on Thursday with a fresh makeup of lawmakers. The ruling People Power Party began a two-day workshop in the city of Tonan, in Chungcheongnam-do province, away from the National Assembly in the capital. President Yoon Song yeol visited to show support and encourage conservative lawmakers to work for the people of South Korea. The PPP floor leader Chu kyung ho said the workshop's main goal is to strengthen solidarity. Chu has had the weight lifted off his shoulders after successfully keeping his PPP representatives from deviating away from the party's stance during the recent parliamentary vote on a contentious bill that aimed to prompt a special investigation into the death of a Marine last year. On Thursday, Chu told the party that they must unite as one to prevent what he described as a flood of legislation from the opposition in the new assembly. Meanwhile, the main opposition Democratic Party, which pushed for the special investigation bill with support from minor parties, both conservative and liberal, initiated its next legislative move. On Thursday, it proposed a modified version of the original bill. The new bill expands the scope of the investigation and allows for greater input from minor opposition parties in the probe team formation process. The party chairman Lee Jae-myung said the DP together with the people will ensure the legislation goes through. The party also introduced what it calls a number one livelihood bill, which if enacted would provide vouchers worth around 250,000 Korean won or 180 US dollars to all citizens of South Korea. They say the vouchers to be used at local businesses will boost spending and revive the economy. The 22nd National Assembly retains the previous parliament's small ruling and large opposition status, consisting of 108 PPP and 171 DP lawmakers. 
A total of 192 seats are taken up by the pan opposition across parties. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. In South Africa, parliamentary elections could see the ruling African National Congress lose its majority for the first time in 30 years, according to recent polls. And Thursday's parliamentary elections, where polls show the country's ruling party, the African National Congress, may lose its majority for the first time since coming to power 30 years ago. So far, ballots from around 43% of voting districts have been counted with the ANC at 43%, followed by the Democratic Alliance at 24%. The ANC won 57% of the vote in 2019 elections, but many blame the party for high levels of unemployment, crime and corruption in the country. Under South Africa's parliamentary system, if a party fails to achieve more than 50% of the votes, political parties must form coalitions. Nearly 28 million out of the 62 million South Africans registered to vote in this general election, with the results expected over the weekend. In Hong Kong, 14 pro-democracy activists were found guilty in a landmark subversion trial which was held yesterday, marking the largest use for so far for a Beijing-imposed national security law. In Hong Kong, 14 pro-democracy activists were found guilty in a landmark subversion trial on Thursday, marking the largest use so far of a Beijing-imposed national security law. The 14 activists, including former lawmakers Lam Chuk Ting, Lung Kwa Kong and Helena Wong, ex-journalist turned campaigner Gwyneth Ho, and ordinary Hong Kong residents who joined the mass protests of 2019, were convicted of conspiracy to commit subversion. They could face up to life in prison in later sentencing. Meanwhile, two defendants, Barrister Lawrence Lau and social worker Li Yue Shun, were acquitted. Those on trial were among the 47 activists arrested three years ago on charges of allegedly trying to overthrow the government by organizing an unofficial primary in 2020. The court ruled that this primary would have created a constitutional crisis for Hong Kong. Moving on to Brazil, the Brazilian authorities are warning of the risks from waterborne diseases as residents of Rio Grande do Sol, Brazil's southernmost state, return to clean up after catastrophic floods that killed at least 169 people. Joyce Foth Correa is one of the many Brazilians returning home after devastating floods in the south of the country. She's overwhelmed by the sight that greets her. I'm destroyed. Worse than a war scenario. Horrible, horrible. I have no words. It's ridiculous. You see, all you achieved and all you fought for, all your history, squandered. But while the damage to property is all too terrible, there are new dangers looming. Authorities are warning of the risk from waterborne disease as residents return to clean up after the floods, which killed at least 169 people. That followed heavy rains in late April which swelled rivers and lakes in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, displacing over 580,000 people. The disease known as leptospirosis, spread by red urine and still water, has become a top concern as cases have risen in recent weeks. Roberta Vanacor is the head of State Health Surveillance Center. Our major worry is leptospirosis. We've had an increase of cases in the last weeks to epidemiologic levels. Nowadays, we have 2,300 cases under investigation. Unfortunately, we've had five deaths, and we have nine deaths under investigation. To meet the high demand for medical care, field hospitals and mobile teams have been set up in the state, already assisting thousands. Residents returning to their home may face yet more challenges, however, including venomous snakes, scorpions, and spiders seeking shelter from rainwater in drier places. Officials warn it's all likely to leave a lasting mental scars on the people of the area. An American Airlines flight was barreling down the runway, about to take off just as a King Air flight was coming to land on an intersecting runway at Regan National Airport. Runway 1, clear for takeoff. 
This morning, another close call on the runway, this time at Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. An American Airlines flight cleared for takeoff, barreling down the runway, just as a King Air flight was coming in to land on an intersecting runway. 2134, cancel takeoff, clearance. To the King Air, zero alpha, alpha, go around, go around. The two aircraft on a potential collision course. The American Airlines flight already accelerating for takeoff, hitting speeds of 110 miles per hour when the air traffic controller told them to abort. That same air traffic controller telling the King airplane to go around, but it was too late. The King Air flight already landed. Zero off, off, I cannot go around. We were already on the ground. The two planes coming just 1,300 feet from one another. It's the latest in a string of incidents on airport runways. Several close calls that have drawn attention to a nationwide shortage in air traffic controllers and stresses on the system. In a statement, American Airlines says the safety of our customers and team members is our top priority, and we're grateful to our crew for their professionalism. We will support the FAA in its investigation. The U.S. State Department stressed that it has no plans to redeploy tactical nuclear arms to the Korean Peninsula. The remarks come after the Kremlin warned that it would consider additional nuclear deterrent steps if the U.S. deploys ground launch immediate range ballistic missiles to the Indo-Pacific. Amid nuclear threats posed by North Korea, a ranking member of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee on Wednesday raised the idea of deploying U.S. tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea to increase deterrence against the regime. To this, Republican Senator Roger Wicker proposed a redeployment of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. However, according to U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedan Patel on Thursday, the U.S. has no plans to redeploy its tactical nuclear arms on the Korean Peninsula. He emphasized that the U.S. does not see returning nuclear weapons to the Indo-Pacific as necessary. The comments also come as Wicker's proposal was met with a heavy pushback from Moscow. In a recent interview, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned that Moscow may consider additional nuclear deterrent steps if the U.S. deploys IRBMs in the Indo-Pacific region. But the U.S. State Department's spokesperson said Lavrov's comments was Russia engaging in nuclear saber rattling. Patel also condemned North Korea's ballistic missile launches on Thursday and noted Beijing's role in helping address the security challenge from Pyongyang. He also commented on the North's sending of balloons carrying trash and fecal matter to the South earlier this week, calling the move malign and destabilizing. U.S. tactical nuclear weapons were withdrawn in South Korea in 1991, and the country has since stuck to its non-nuclear status, relying on the U.S.'s security commitment. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. A company in Southern California is putting dogs to work to help children become more confident and do not need to do a whole lot to get the job done. The therapy dogs are tasked with comforting elementary kids. A company in Southern California is putting dogs to work while also helping kids become more confident. And then everyone cries. The pups don't need to do a whole lot to get the job done. The therapy dogs are tasked with comforting elementary kids. This polar baby loves to fish. Which the parents told KCBS they're all for. They do want a dog very much, but we gave them a baby this year, so we thought that this would be <laughs> we thought that this would be kind of a way that we can get around that for a little while. It's all part of a canine literacy program that improves mental health provides anxiety relief and gives the kids confidence to read better. Some children have difficulty in the classroom reading aloud. They're afraid they're going to be judged. The kids are going to laugh at them. And our dogs provide that non-judgmental environment where they can make mistakes. The dog's not going to correct them. Not only are the dogs adorable, but studies say that petting one is a great way to reduce blood pressure. You can go on forever and 
and you can never stop reading and you're like in this magical land of the storybook. She has this year kind of come out of her shell. She's in a play and kind of getting into more performing things that um, before she maybe was a little bit more shy. So I really think it's the dogs. It's a rough job, but someone's got to do it. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again on Monday for more key updates from across the group. Thank you for watching. Good night.